Welcome everyone. I want to start with a short story. This is one representation of the Middle Age. It looks nice, isn't it? It looks like everybody's happy and that it is a much better time than it is in 2023. But I do believe that this painting is actually a more accurate description of the Middle Age indeed. As you can see, people can actually find the food, there is nothing to help them, and all they have to do is to hope for better times. Now, the point I want to make is one that W. Brian Arthur made in the past. Technology is what separates us from the Middle Ages. To give some numbers, let's have a look at what the OECD is telling us. Innovation accounts for at least 50% of economic growth from 1995 to 2013. That's big. It means that innovation is creating wealth and that is indeed the wealth that we can then redistribute. This is the context in which we studied foundation AI models. We want and need innovation in the space and elsewhere. When I say we, I mean Sandy Penton from the MIT and myself in a working paper that we put out just a couple of weeks ago entitled Competition Between AI Foundation Models, Dynamics and Policy Recommendations. Please feel free to use the QR code that appears right above me to openly access the paper. All right, so what's in it? First, what are we talking about when discussing AI foundation models? Well, we actually think that AI foundation models is too broad of a category because what you see is that there are different dynamics between different types of foundation models. On that basis, we offer a new taxonomy for the purpose of better understanding the competitive dynamics and tailoring policy recommendations that are adapted to fostering innovation in the space. The first type of AI foundation model is what we call the general public foundation models. When it comes to access, they can be used by any internet user. When it comes to use, a distinction has to be made between general purpose and domain specific foundation models. The general purpose foundation models are the ones that you can use for any things that may come to your mind, whether it is to make business decisions, find recipes, and so on and so forth. The domain specific foundation models are the ones that are actually tailored to something very specific, such as Bloomberg ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot. Those are foundation models that you can use for just one specific use case. All of those are trained with online information. The second type of AI foundation models is what we called ecosystem foundation models. Those are the ones that only a specific group of users can indeed access. When it comes to use, they can be helpful when it comes to uncovering typical behaviors in given situations. For example, one can imagine that accounting firms may want to uncover what other firms will do in a similar situation. These ecosystem foundation models are actually fine-tuned with data that is not freely accessible on the web, but that is in the possession of the groups of users, the groups of companies providing the data to such an ecosystem foundation model. The third and final type of AI foundation model is what we call personal foundation models. These models can be accessed by just one user, be it an individual such as you and me, a company, a government, and so on and so forth. They can be used to better inform individual behaviors or decision, and they are typically fine-tuned with your own private data, such as what you have done in the past, your daily activity, etc. Okay, now that we have defined the three types of AI foundation models, we think that we are better equipped to understand the competitive dynamics between them and inside of each of those models. More specifically, we seek to answer whether open source models have a chance to survive against the models that are controlled by the big tech companies. Now, the story is slightly more complicated than that because some of the models controlled by the big tech companies are made open source. That's the case of Llama, the one that is indeed published by Meta, former Facebook company. But in any case, to understand the dynamics between those models, we think that we first have to look, of course, at the design, their ability to scale because they are indeed well-coded, well-constructed, and the learning is efficient. That ability to learn is dependent on big data and unique data. We think that although big data is a necessary condition for you to be able to compete, 
it is far from being a sufficient condition for you to be in a position to take over your competitors. There are two main reasons for that. First, small data sets can actually compete with big data sets and small companies can access large amounts of data. If you are interested in more technical details, we have listed some of the papers that are actually being deployed by small companies open source project to indeed do more with the data that they have already. More importantly, we think that access to unique data is what may indeed define competition in the space. There are two reasons for that. Access to unique data may allow the company to give the very specific answer that the user is looking for. If we take Google as an example, the company has access to YouTube transcripts of all the videos, all the comments. The company is indeed in a position to better understand how people react to certain subjects, to certain creators, which is very valuable information. Now, that information may be the one that users are looking for. For example, you may want to know what are the five music videos that are the most commonly watched on YouTube in June or July of 2023. If you don't have access to YouTube data, you won't be able to provide that very specific answer. But that data may also be used by YouTube in the context of deploying a foundation AI model to better understand the profile of the user, to better understand the trends, and therefore tailor a more general question according to what they expect the user may want to receive as an answer. Now, on top of the ability to learn from the data set, the design of a foundation model will actually imply some cost and we think that this might be relevant, although it is hard to assess in July of 2023 whether or not the cost will play a defining role in the competitive landscape. If we look at what's happening today, it's expensive and that's undeniable, which favors the big players and plays against the open source models. To be more specific, OpenAI spent 440 million US dollar in 2022 alone for the purpose of developing GPT-4. The very same company spent 700 thousand US dollar per day for the sake of running ChatGPT, which is not something that a small company can afford easily. But if we look at the dynamic in the space, we see that chip makers such as Nvidia are actually cutting down the cost of training, fine tuning those LLMs and then operating those LLMs. That company argues that from the 10 million USD necessary just a couple of weeks ago for the purpose of creating such an LLM, just 400 thousand USD are now required. And there are new model compression and algorithms. A team of researchers from Berkeley University argues that thanks to their attention algorithms, 50% less GPU are required to train one LLM. And there are other good enough LLMs, meaning LLMs that most users won't be able to differentiate from the biggest one out there that are being trained on smartphone. So in a nutshell, the cost may play an important role, but it may not be necessarily the defining factor in the space. Now, we think the analysis can't be complete just looking at the design of LLM, meaning that it won't necessarily be the best LLM out there when it comes to the ability to actually learn from the data set or to be able to train that LLM at a lower cost that would necessarily emerge as being the winning LLM in the space out there. The learning curve will play an important role in defining the competitive dynamics in the AI foundation model space. The logic is the following. The more users a AI foundation model can attract, the better the training, so the better the results, therefore the better the ability to attract the users, Thus, the better the ability to generate profit, to use those profits to actually pay to get access to unique data sets. So to get a better product, to attract more users, and so on and so forth. And this is where our taxonomy between the three types of AI foundation model will play an important role, because you see that they do not benefit from the learning curve in similar proportions. Let's have a look at our overall take. When it comes to general public foundation model, we think that the increasing return, the learning curve, is significant. The more users, the more they can attract, the more they can improve the service, get access to unique data sets, and so on and so forth. When it comes to ecosystem foundation model, we think that the increasing returns are moderate. They are moderate because to some degree, they are existing within the ecosystem, within the industry, but limited to one specific use case. 
and when it comes to personal foundation model, the increase in returns are rather small. They are small because it is actually much harder to deploy such a fine tuning to another users, meaning that each individual, each government, each company will have some specificities that will require some more fine tuning and therefore will reduce the ability to increase the returns. And so of course it matters for competition. There are actually two lessons from that. Lesson number one, when it comes to AI foundation models benefiting from a high increasing returns, such as general public foundation models, we think that the ecosystem is likely to be dominated by a handful of companies, the one benefiting from those high increasing returns. This doesn't mean that the very same players will dominate the entirety of the ecosystem, because indeed maintaining such market position is also hard. So if you see that the ecosystem remains static, frozen, look for all the reasons that simply looking at the increasing returns, it might be that there are network effects, that there are some practices being implemented. Lesson number two, while the increasing returns are rather small, such as they are for personal models, we think that history matters a little bit less, which means that companies won't be in a position to build on previous success to actually ensure that tomorrow will be as successful as yesterday. In that ecosystem, we think that design is actually more important. Why is it? Because it means that if you design your personal foundation model in a way that is clever, you may be indeed in a position to capture users and provide them with a better service than the ones that are being used for years and years and years. And if you look at the general dynamics in the space, not even talking about AI foundation models, you see that over 40 billion USD has been invested in the personal development industry in 2021. Therefore, the incentives to enter the market are high and should give dynamic competition. On that basis, Sandy and I come up with several recommendations for the policymakers. First, we argue that innovation in the space should be given priority. This doesn't mean that innovation should always be maximized at the cost of everything else, such as safety and security. This means that innovation should be elevated at a fundamental level so that only human rights and fundamental rights can actually trump innovation but not all of the other variables that are not so important when it comes to wealth creation. Now, we also come up with more concrete propositions in a policy agenda meant to foster innovation and competition in the space. First, we think it's important to distribute equally the regulatory burden in the space. Regulations can indeed have the effect of protecting the big players in the space if this very same regulatory burden is imposed on all the players. We think that the approach that has been taken by the European Commission, for example, in the Digital Services Act, where the bigger your company is, the more you have to comply with certain requirements, is actually the right approach. If we do not follow such an approach, it means that it will actually put small companies in a position where they will have to make a choice between innovating and actually complying with the AI regulation. The alternative of that is not to focus on the size of the companies, but how many users are using a specific service. For instance, if you see that a company has less than 100 users, you may want to impose less regulatory burden on that company than another small companies with 10 million users. Second, when it comes to intellectual property rights, we think it's important for the sake of preserving competition in the space to allow all the companies to train their foundation models on data that is already publicly available, but that might be proprietary or personal in nature. If we do not allow such a training, it will certainly benefit the big players who are able to pay to access unique data sets that is in the possession of other companies. Three, when it comes to the expertise, we think it's absolutely crucial for the policymakers and the regulators to acquire AI expertise so that they can balance the necessity for innovation in the space versus all the fundamental rights. We also praise what has been done in the UK with the creation of a informal council of regulatory agencies discussing digital issues. We think the very same should be done when it comes to AI, as opposed to creating an AI regulator that can be more easily captured. Fourth, and this is more specific to antitrust, we think that exemptions are to be created for open access and open source companies. We may want to allow those companies to pull their resources in joint venture without having to notify that as a merger. We may want to allow strategic alliances between those companies without calling that a cartel. And last, we may want to extend the scope of the research and development block exemption so that indeed it is easier for the companies in the space to cooperate and compete against the large players.
Last, we develop what we call adaptive regulations in the space, meaning regulations that actually document the effect of what they produce on the market and adapt to those effects so that they better increase the common good. And our very last point concerns enforcement actions. We think that the absolute priority for governmental agencies is to target the behaviors that reduce the ability of all the companies to benefit from the increasing returns, i.e. the learning effect. On the other end, the practices that affect prices or the ability to access big data, as we explain, are not so defining of the competitive dynamics and therefore shouldn't be given the priority. When it comes to sanction, all the practices that are reducing innovation should be severely punished. However, all the practices that may actually increase innovation may want to be balanced and or exempted if indeed we can prove that they benefit competition and dynamisms in the space. This is all we wanted to cover with the video. You do have my email address over here. You can join Sunny and I on Twitter and we are uh, welcoming comments on the uh, working paper that uh, is uh, pretty accessible. So uh, please uh, be sure to be in touch. Take care of yourself and if you can, someone else too. Bye bye.